Before getting into the video, I just wanted to say thank you all. This past week we hit 27 thousand subscribers. As a celebration and a way of showing thanks, I've decided to get you all a little something. At the end of this video, stick around because I'm baking you all a cake. Just a little gift from me to you to say, oh wait, no, this video is about Portal. Oh crap, you're all gonna think I'm lying. I Look, I swear to God, at the end of this video, there is a cake. You have my word, but uh, you're just gonna think this is a setup for some cheap 17 year old cake is a lie joke. Oh, you're gonna think I'm just doing dead memes. Oh God, crap, no. Oh. By the way, this is the science of Portal. Richard, proceed with that intro. This video was voted on by all my patrons. If you want to support the channel more directly and get access to all sorts of perks like early access and exclusive live streams, check the link in the description down below. Here's a one second sneak peek of what you're missing out on if you're still on the fence. Mom, I have some bad news. Your husband is dead. I killed him. Today, we're talking about the game Portal. For those of you who haven't played these games yet, uh, first of all, go play them. They're maybe my favorite games, full stop. The main gimmicks of these games is, well, portals. I mean, it's literally in the name. You got a gun that can shoot a blue portal onto one wall and orange onto another, and those two points are instantly connected in space. Walk through one portal and you'll pop out the other. Pretty simple. It's also established in these games that portals maintain an object's momentum. So if you throw an object really fast through one portal, it will continue to go really fast out the other end. Though potentially in a different direction, depending on how you oriented the portals. Now, the science of portals is a pretty deep topic. There's a lot to potentially talk about here. So to prevent this video from turning into an hour long meandering lecture on relativity and wormhole physics, I had everyone on my patron exclusive Discord server, which you can get access to by supporting at any tier, to give me their biggest burning questions and strange portal paradoxes. I have four problems that I'm going to be looking into today, starting with a classic. We know that if you throw a moving object through a portal, it will maintain its speed. But what would happen if you moved a portal really quickly through a stationary object? Would it simply plop out the other side, maintaining its initial speed of zero? Or would it go shooting off at the speed of the moving portal? Unfortunately, in the game, you're not allowed to place a portal on a moving surface. Probably so they didn't have to deal with problems just like this. But luckily, we don't need those pesky game designers to answer this question. Not when we have physics. Now, at first, you might be inclined to say that option A is correct. If the portal maintains the speed of the object passing through them, then we could set up a very simple equation like this. Speed in equals speed out. If the speed of the block going in is zero, then the speed of the block going out is also zero. This would be absolutely correct if the speed of the initial block were actually zero. But it's not. Uh, now, hang on, I hear you say. We've established that the block isn't moving, and as we all know, speed is defined as a change in position over time. Am I really trying to suggest that a block that is not moving is actually moving? Pfft, no, no, of course I'm not suggesting that. Albert Einstein is suggesting it. Let me explain. Way back in 1687, Sir Isaac Newton published a book called Principa Mathematica where he outlined his laws of motion that described how all objects move. And those laws lay unchallenged for a cool 218 years until 1905 when one Albert Einstein discovered that, well, Newton wasn't wrong per se, he just didn't have the full picture. Einstein proposed his theory of relativity, 
which hinges on the idea that we can only ever measure things relative to something else. We know that a car is traveling 60 miles an hour because we can compare it to the road, street signs, and trees that aren't moving. Except all of those things are moving. They are located on a planet that's rotating around an axis. And that planet is moving around the sun, which is itself moving around the Milky Way galaxy, which is also, well, you get the idea. What I'm trying to say is we live in a relativistic world. That car could be traveling at any number of speeds, really, depending on what you use as your reference point. Going back to the portal example, we can think of this as a moving portal going through a stationary object or a moving object going through a stationary portal. Mathematically, the distinction is meaningless. So our simple equation of speed in equals speed out really should look something more like this, taking the speed of both the block and the portal into account. The speed of the block itself isn't what remains constant, it's the speed of the block relative to the portal. So, if the block has an initial speed of zero, and the portal has an initial speed of 10 miles per hour, and we know that the second portal has a speed of zero, then we can find that the block will need to have a speed of 10 miles per hour for the momentum to be preserved. And, in fact, we can get even more complicated here. Say you had two portals that were both moving and you threw a block into one of them with its own initial speed, then all you gotta do is plug everything in, make sure you keep track of your signs, and we can solve for the final speed of that block. As it turns out, this supposed portal paradox is actually pretty simple. So let's make things a little more complicated, shall we? Say you have two portals facing each other, exactly one meter apart. Now let's say you take a pole that's exactly one meter long, place it between those portals, and weld the ends together. Effectively, you have now created a loop of metal that is a straight line. Pretty mind-bending stuff already. Now what would happen if you took one of those portals and started to move it away? Would you create an infinitely long pole? Would the pole break? Would you tear the fabric of reality in twine? Let's break it down. If you looked down the line of portals while doing this experiment, it would appear that the pipe is infinitely long, just extending forever. So, it would seem like you should be able to move the second portal away as much as you want, and more and more pipe would just spit out. Effectively, you're printing more pipe. But, as I'm sure you figured out by the flow of these reveals so far, that's not actually the case. Because while this may appear to be an infinitely long pole, it isn't really. It's the same one meter of pole that you're just seeing from an infinite number of angles, making it appear to be infinitely long. To make things easier to keep track of and visualize, let's break this pipe up into segments. As the orange portal begins to move to the left, the red segment of the pipe emerges. However, in order for the red segment of the pipe to emerge from the orange portal, it must first enter the blue portal. In order for it to enter the blue portal though, it has to pull all the previous segments with it. But since we welded the pipe to itself in a loop, then the red segment is itself a previous segment. So effectively, this segment of pipe is being pulled in two different directions. Remember, there's only one meter of pipe, and now it's being stretched between two points that are greater than a meter apart. Effectively, you have an identical setup to a tensile strength testing machine, which is used by material scientists to test the strength of different materials. Normally, you take a rod and clamp each end into one of these brackets, which proceeds to pull harder and harder until the pipe 
snaps. This portal setup would accomplish the same thing, exerting a tensile load on the pipe until it snaps in the plane of the portal, where it's being pulled apart. But speaking of the plane of a portal, that leads us into an interesting question posed by Aspa102 on my Discord. How sharp would the edge of a portal be? In the games, each portal has a glowing aura around it, so I imagine they'd be pretty hot. But ignoring that, if you place a portal on one wall and it instantly transports you to another, would that mean that you have effectively created an infinitely thin edge around them? In reality, it's impossible to say whether or not portals themselves would have some sort of thickness to them. Uh, in all actuality, a wormhole like this would be spherical and not have an edge to begin with, but in the games, we can confirm that the portals are completely two-dimensional. If you line yourself up just right between the two, you can see the line completely disappear. So if the portals are infinitely thin, what would happen if you stuck your hand through and moved it? Would it completely sever your hand the moment you touched it? Or would a plane that's infinitely thin be too narrow to actually do any damage, simply sliding between the gaps in the atoms of your body? It may seem like an infinitely thin plane should be infinitely sharp, and therefore capable of cutting anything. But, in reality, you're absolutely right. This thing would cleave your hand right off. See, I'm not always so predictable. Why? Well, normally, when you want to cut something, you'd use a wedge. The way we quantify the cutting power of a wedge is by using something called mechanical advantage. This is basically how much extra power you're getting out of a blade or wedge. If you multiply the force you're exerting on the blade by the mechanical advantage of said blade, then you can find the force exerted on the thing you're trying to cut. Mechanical advantage is pretty easy to calculate. You just multiply the length of the blade you're using by the thickness at any point you choose. As the thickness of the blade gets narrower and narrower, the mechanical advantage gets larger and larger, approaching a value of infinity. So if you had a plane that was truly infinitely thin or even close to it, it could cut literally anything with no force required. And it doesn't matter that the plane is thinner than the quarks in your subatomic particles, you've completely separated your hand from the rest of your body in space, and it took zero force to do it. Well, with that absolutely horrifying knowledge in your head, let's move on to something a little less dread-inducing. The cold, empty vacuum of space. Also, spoiler alert for the ending of Portal 2, if you haven't played it yet and don't want to be ruined, then you can go ahead and take off now. But this final question comes from Captain Kirby, and it has to do with how portals interact with gravity. At the end of Portal 2, you shoot a portal all the way up onto the moon, and everything in the lab is sucked in. Now, normally, when you have two portals that are on different orientations, gravity will simply readjust when you enter the portal. So if you walked through a portal on the wall and popped out on the ceiling, it's not like gravity would flip for you, you'd just fall like normal. And probably get super motion sick, to be honest. However, for this final portal, when everything is being pulled in, it seems like everything is falling up away from the surface of the moon. In this case, it seems like gravity is being maintained through the portal. Everything that fell through continues to fall up. So what's going on here? Does it have to do with the fact that the gravity on the moon is less powerful than that on Earth? Is the Earth's gravitational field being sucked through the portal itself? Well, looking closer, I actually don't think gravity has anything to do with this. Rather, this all has to do with pressure. See, here on Earth, we have an atmosphere, obviously. And all that air, it turns out, is pretty heavy. 
So heavy that if you're standing at sea level, there is an average of 14.7 pounds of air pushing down on each square inch of your body. The moon, on the other hand, has no atmosphere. It's exposed to the empty vacuum of space, where the pressure is, effectively, zero. And one thing you should know about pressure is that it likes to equalize itself. If you have a balloon with very high pressure, that pressure is going to try to escape out into the less pressured atmosphere. Or if you had a container with low pressure, then the atmosphere is going to try to push in on it. So when you open a portal that connects an area of high pressure, Earth, to an area of low pressure, the moon, all that air is going to be sucked through to try to equalize the pressure on both sides. So it's not gravity that's hurling Wheatley and the remains of the Aperture facility into space, but the violent current of air as our atmosphere is being sucked into space. I guess it's a good thing Gladys closed it, right? And there you have it. All your burning portal questions answered. If you got any more, drop them in the comments below, and who knows, maybe I'll come back for a part two. This is a lot of fun. Oh, and before you go, you didn't think I'd forget, did you? Folks, when I promise something, I always follow through. Though, I must admit, I wasn't entirely honest with you at the beginning of this video. The cake is not a lie. But we are absolutely doing dead memes. Thank you all so much for 27,000 subscribers. May your luck be better than Brian's. May you always excuse your princesses. And may your cakes be forever true. And a massive thank you to all my patrons, including Alakazam, Aspa102, Big Dog Tie for to Win, Sidian, Gremlin the Goblin, Sherry and Mark, Starjoy, The Boss Killer 94, and Captain Kirby.